Today we're doing chapter four, which is called Class Exploitation and Economic Rent, Reflection on Sorensen's Toward a Sounder Basis for Class Analysis. This chapter, I think, made some of us quite mad. Let's hit into it. The overview. Okay. Since the majority of Marxists have abandoned Marx's labor theory of value as a coherent framework for economic analysis, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the concept, like, That's these tough. lines are actually, you know, most of the, nearly all the stuff I have in here are direct quotes from the thing. So they're not me, like, giving my analysis unless it's in a hard bracket or something like that. Okay. The, the concept of exploitation has come to seem more like a heavy handed piece of antiquated rhetoric than a rigorous tool for understanding the inner workings of class relations in a capitalist society. Oh, God, right. Okay. Two, Sorensen argues Marxists are correct in placing exploitation at the center of class analysis, as it has a greater potential for explaining the structural foundations of social conflicts over inequality than the material life conditions concept of class. What the hell does that mean? Are structural, like we believe that structural foundations are more explanatory than material li the material life conditions conception because we would say that the structural foundations are the material life conditions. Like no, it's no. a weird binary to put to put out. It, it, actually. It's com it's coming from the earlier chapters when making the distinctions between like I don't know Bourdieu and whatever class analysis it, it, versus uh, the the other kinds. Yeah, right. It's the strat stratification view. I think is what he's he's criticizing yeah. here. Exactly. Yeah. He proposes rehabilitating the concept of exploitation by closely identifying it with the concept of rent. Economic Let's all pretend everything is futile. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going, look, we're going there. Like that's, yeah, we'll, we'll get it. We are going there, but like, that's not, that doesn't explain the 20th century for shit. <laughs> well, I, I actually meant like analytically speaking, people are going there. Everyone's like, oh, I guess it's just all rents and feudalism and blah, 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 blah. And, and they're really bracketing out what we would call like exploitation as being an important factor. Yeah, like I think the the, the post-war compromise actually hit the rentier pretty hard. You know, that was mm -hmm. Keynes's Keynes's idea, and the, the rentier is coming back. But the you know, but the rentier is is one of the major components of capitalism. There's rent. There's exploitation. You know, they're they're your two two guys. And we're going to see here what happens when you try and make it just rent. And what happens? I mean, so, rent is direct extraction. I mean, like that's like it's not even hidden. I think that's like one of the, like that's why this does so much damage to Marxist theory. If if you like, I don't know. But rents can be hidden too, Derek. Like when you're buying like a, a, an item in the shop and you don't know what the you know the brand rent or the oh yeah you know, yeah yeah, yeah. But, stuff. So that can be like obfuscated too. Okay, well, last one. While E.O. Wright is also committed committed to reconstructing an exploitation-centered concept of class, the objective of this chapter is to explain why rent alone does not provide a sounder basis for class analysis. Okay? So E.O. Wright is on our side, but but not. So Yeah, yeah. It's, he's, he's navigating the Scylla and Charybdis here. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'd say a few things is that it's just a fact that the the literature that was built up over the 20th century to defend the labor theory of value turned out to be on faulty ground and was disassembled during Wright's lifetime as a working sociologist. And he started off as a proponent of those kinds of labor theory of value and was publicly convinced out of it. To, to be fair, his but his, his his framework for what, X, for what LTV was was Schaffrian labor theory of price. If I'm getting this right, this is, it's like the Borkowitz thing, right? Okay. Like, and so it might, it may be, like some people turn to Shraffa as basically like, well, Shraffa like is just basically doing the same thing or whatever. But some people, I think, I think Wright was, was more like of a, if, if I had to, it's been a long time since I've read his early work on value, but I think he was a little more of a, common sense like uh you know sweezy type but of sweezy doesn't believe in ltv either yeah like and that right right no but the um but sweezy believed that uh borkowitz put i think it was sweezy that was part of po popularizing, popularizing borkowitz borkowitz. As, as, yeah as as a popularization uh like it's kind of mind-bending sweezy thought that borkowitz was like putting the labor theory of value on solid ground or something it's kind of insane if you think about the intentions of Borkovitz and 
whatever. But like, by putting, they're, they're, by, by, by by abstracting from time and having like equilibrium, your your prices find their equilibrium immediately. You solve like your equations for one for one price. You have a you, value. The concept of value becomes irrelevant. Things deduce down to the physical commodities ratios of physical commodities, and that's the critique I think that Wright accepted. And right. I think it's fair enough to accept that critique in the seventies, right? I don't think that's until that idea of hey, hey, wait a second, actually you're just putting in general equilibrium theory right into this. That's a huge assumption that obviously would would fuck everything up when you take you take abstract time out of it. Of course, capital would go all fuckways. And but I think it's fair enough for in the seventies to have that. And maybe it's fair enough that you don't later on I- interact so much with the TSSI because it's 20 years ago and you've moved on in your life. Maybe that's fair enough. But then, like, I think where his politics uh, ends up, I don't, I don't know that much about it, but, like, I think the, my, for me, the big problem with this chapter is that he takes on board, like, arguments by neoclassicals in a way that, like, you give them the benefit of doubt Always giving the, the, the liberal theories the benefit of over, the benefit over over Marxist theories. And I want to point out that like Farjun and the O'Connor physicist reconceptualization as as a value as an attractor to price in aggregate, not as a price, as a statistical function, which Marx does not have the formal math to do. That was published in 1984. So but no, it's probably but, pretty obscure, though, as well, Derek. Let, let's yeah. face it. You know, these, it was it, it was obscure, and and he loses the faith in value theory in about seventy nine. And he's he's not an economist. He uh, he ends up exporting his economic thought to John Romer for a number of years before departing from Romer's framework. Right, but um, I mean, I read Romer. I I read Romer's like generally assuming equilibrium theory all over the place, and even even at times. This is where it's still hard for me to defend Esri because in the 90s, post-Keynesians were already doing good empirical work showing that there is no, there's no reason to assume equilibrium ever happens in the markets or that getting closer to equilibrium will produce equilibrium results. They had that math done in the 90s. So, I think that, I don't even think you know. I think that math was all. I think that was always understood as well. Like it was never like that's how people uh, thought. Tom, like I th- no, Tom. It's I. I can't buy that, Tom, because the thing is that the thing about neoclassical economics that is the most galling is that they. And on the one hand, they. They posit that perfect competition is an unworldly, unworldly thing that cannot actually exist. But on the other hand, they fudge the adjective perfect here to actually be a value judgment of this is how things are in heaven. And we need to adjust the world to get closer to perfect competition even though it has no significant relationship to anything that exists in reality. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it may be a double think thing where it's like, yeah, this, this doesn't exist in the real world, but also this is the standard of what utopia looks like and everything needs to get closer to it. And that's very, very obvious if you look at neoclassical socialism in the mid 20th century, or you look at like, you know, died in the wall, hardcore neoliberals in the nineties, that this, this was a utopian project for them. And it was very much using quote unquote, perfect competition as the yardstick to adjust the world to. And they were basic. This is this is where I have to pick up on something that Kyle just implied, but didn't go into. The early neoclassicals thought they were socialists. They were not part of a neoliberal conspiracy or a liberal conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, and, and and you also had in the Eastern Bloc uh, Marxists who came out of the Stalinist tradition and converted to the neoclassical tradition as a better representation of what socialism ought to be and how sort of market socialism could be reformed. Like what what I would say, I know Kyle, you're pushing back on me, but like, let's be honest. Like there was always, 
critique of neoclassical at all times. There was other schools, you know. Of course, the, of course, there was, yeah. but so, but 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 the neoclassicals annihilated them after World War II. Well, that's like, fair enough. Well, the, that's the, fair. Neo, the neoclassicals achieved the kind of academic closure that who was it now? Was it Wright was talking about, like that he dreamed about as a young man with, yeah. Uh, yeah. like you know, yeah. the, yes. the night of night. the that's night of socialism thing. unseats yeah. the night of capitalism in the academy? Yes. The neoclassicals did that to yes, all did. other schools of economics. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't like, like I, I would make the case. What I was trying to say is that the critiques that Derek said came up in the nineties, they were there from fucking probably the nineteen twenties. The exact same critiques. Well, sort of. You know. I, I'm going to push back on that a little bit because the nineties critiques are actually are actually ways of mathematically working out things that have been said about neoclassical economics from the beginning. So, it, it, in some sense, you're right. But the the assumptions that they actually made to make those arguments were actually neoclassical assumptions. So they assumed that that perfect competition was actually a good. What they tried to what they tried to and did prove is attempting to move closer to perfect competition did not produce either the efficiency or the welfare gains that perfect competition would do. In fact, in, in some cases, it would get wildly variant. There was no reason to assume any linear relationship and they had to map that out. So what I find interesting about, about those Keynesians is they were effectively, I mean, kind of accidentally even doing something like Marx does. They were taking all the critiques, you know, and positions held by neoclassicals as given and then mapped it out. And to be fair to them and not to the Marxists, we never did that. We never like we never did the imminent critique of neoclassical stuff, accepting their framework and then working out what ha what would happen. Unless we count this stuff, because Romer does. And once and this is what I was trying to get to once that Wright's faith in the labor theory of value is such a shattered, he turns to Romer's framework and John Romer's framework is you know, it's very much based in neoclassical economics. And I would say it's insufficiently critical. But, you know, that was the attempt to do an imminent critique. I think ultimately the neoclassical economics has such a... But what Romer just, actually... Such, such a questionable truth claim with regards to its methodology that imminent critique is actually kind of hard to do. Because right. it's well, baked into the modeling. But Romer's picture is one where exploitation is fundamentally exchange oriented, which, you know, there is a Marxist way of understanding that. So I don't I don't want to get into that. But then using neoclassical like modeling, his framework doesn't even require a labor market. You could have exploitation on a debt on like a credit market. It's all it's just all about assets and income flows, which, and I think the right way to read this book is to situate these debates in a lot of the analytical Marxist debates that Wright cared a lot about, you know, as a younger man. Sure. And so th this, this is like the theory that he's attacking here. It's not the same as Romer's, right? And it's not the same as the theory that he held, but it's close. It's close to the theory that Romer held, and specifically with regards to the way that Romer describes socialist exploitation and status exploitation in actually existing socialism. It is very, like, it's not the same. And by reading this chapter, you can see it's not the same because, you know, there's still, there's still exploitation in perfect competition. It's not purely rent as exploitation, but I think it's, I think that's part of the motivation for this chapter and part of the motivation for Wright's turn away from Romer is to develop a more abstract sociological critique of exploitation happening in, in like almost all, con in all conceivable capital scenarios, basically. Like, but this is the problem with so many of these books where like, it's a similar problem with the Kleinman book where you're having people like making a big deal out of fights from the eighties that are dead by the time the book is actually released. 
Like this has this has the virtue of reframing it in terms of a contemporary sociology. Like the last chapter is about Charles Tilley, but it's really about G. A. Cohen versus J John Elster, and it is they, they are pretty important like methodological issues. But but like even some of the statements in this like the majority of Marxists have abandoned labor theory of value no, is not, not true. true anymore. I, I don't even think it was true then. I think if you were to it say was, it was, it was true then. Uh, I like well, it depends what you mean by you say who when you say the majority of Marxists, right? That like if you were to say the majority of Western econo economist Marxists, Marxists, yeah, okay. I would, would say yes. Uh, I would actually like say that. that most of the Soviets had actually given up on LBT. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't make the Western qualifier there. That the the the. the uh, so, like, for that, example, let me look, let me clarify. Like, we, were, clarify. We, were talking, we were talking about like imminent critique of Marxism from a neoclassical perspective. I just want to point out that the mathematical Marxists in Japan were also doing that, not Western Marxists. Eastern Bloc, lots of Marxists converted to neoclassical economics. It was it was pretty much pervasive. Like, quel surprise, you know. <laughs> but I, what I, what I'm saying when he says Marxists, we're not talking about the academy. He's talking about academy yeah, Marxists. Yeah. yeah, you talk about run-of-the-mill people reading Marx and Capital and people in organizations. They didn't throw out the labor theory of value. I, You're talking I, about academy. I still think there were so many Marxists at that time who were who took their Marxism primarily from David Harvey that they would they would qualify as someone who thrown the, out the, the, the labor theory of value. And from the 20 years prior to that, from Paul Sweezy. I mean, that's the other thing. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, yeah, like, yeah. like LVT doesn't even get discussed in Christopher Lash, because Lash actually pretty much accepts Sweezy's framework. Like, he just, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't disbelieve in it. He just doesn't bring it up at all. Like, it's not there. It's um, also, uh, also true of uh, the Frankfurt School. They yeah. just accept it. They accept Sweezy's uh, interpretation as given. Yeah, they don't yeah. believe in. They don't believe in. They don't talk about LTV at all after after Grossman. Yeah. that's also where they get this idea of administrative class. You know, it's 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 the weak thing where like when someone like Chris Catrone tries to say that we're in a new period of capital where marginalism actually does apply. Like that's where they get it from, actually. So, so to say that it had no effect on on Marxists in the streets would would be to say that the new left didn't happen. No, and, I'm not. I'm not saying it had no effect. You know, I'm just saying like, I don't know. Like, though, the, I, I, I find that, that, like, I find the, that the, statement the, pejorative. Uh, like, I I think people can be in these circles of of academia and like the people on the street who have their concept of like exploitation and Marx and, you know, had know a little bit about capital. They are Marxists too. I, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, For that's sure. absolutely true, Tom. But I do agree that, that people, uh, Marxists who held that opinion were a minority uh, at the turn of the century. And I think that's much less true now. Yeah. 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 I 20, think that's fair. 20, 2015 was, you know, long time ago, lads. Like <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, not, not, everyone's daughter was a Stalinist then. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, it's easy to forget what it was like. And yeah, Marxist theory was, was in deep disrepute even then. Yeah. I'm just so, going to say like, I do remember like everybody agreeing with Zizek on and, and talking and like, these are people in the street talking about post-structuralist theories of value because they don't mm -hmm. know that, like they literally haven't been educated that the words mean something different this is actually why I started doing a lot of the explainer videos and stuff I started doing is I realized that like no one knew that the words just meant different fucking things. And they just happened to be the same word in English and neoclassicals and post-structuralists were deliberately taking advantage of that. Yes. Um, and I, I actually want to add that at that time, reading David Harvey was the closest you would get to understanding that there was a distinction even if he would even if he refuted or if even if he argued against marx's theory he at least brought it up which was uh a break with the general atmosphere of, 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 mm -hmm. of debate yeah like I, i'd say there's probably like i don't know like if you go back 10 or 15 years ago and you're to think about who calls themselves marxists in say the uk or ireland I think most of them are probably somehow closely related to sects, and probably most of them had a had an understanding of the LTV as a kind of 
their basic understanding. Whether... I would agree with you, except for the except for the SWP, which was the largest one, because the SWP had taken on this weird hybrid of of Altusair and Harvey, actually, as their explanatory mechanism. Like that was how people were coming into it. And it was weird because they still, this is where you're kind of right, Tom, but like, because they taught classical Trotskyism, which requires L, uh, LTV, like to the cadres, but their actual intellectual core and what they would give people when they thought they were ready was not that at all. Oh, I can and, imagine that. I can imagine that. Yeah. I fully, um, I fully um, expect that to be true. I don't, so, I'm sorry for making this argument. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's okay. But I just think, granted, all this context, like the fact that you know, Wright goes from arguing a view that accepts something like a neoclassical Marxist view of exploitation, and then I think it's around the two thousand. I think it's around two thousand because I, I don't remember seeing this stuff in Wright's work until around then. He takes a step back from Romer's framework. And makes it more, just a bit more abstract, so that it's not so much about. It's not he he does quote Romer in this, so it's not like he's getting completely away from it. Actually, I think Wright moderates in, in exactly the right direction. That you know, we we still have like a, an abstract critique of exploitation that would operate in perfect competition, and something that is you know specifically talking about appropriation of labor effort. It's more of a, it's again, like Wright is recalling G.A. Cohen's argument about the labor theory of value and the critique of exploitation in general, and just trying to preserve the basic conceptual core that functioning labor markets, even if they're, you know, not producing monopoly rents, are exploited. Like, and that it's about labor, which is where he departs from Romer. Like it's about appropriation of labor effort, and that's what class is about. Yes. Well, like we're going to get to it in a while. Like, but there's like one thing in like neoclassical economics. You know, I'm not really, I'm not very read up on, but like I know that there are factors of production, and each factor gets its return. You know, like capital gets a return, labor gets a return, and I think that in this argument we're going to get to later on. I think there's a problem in there whereby he. I don't know if he deals properly with taking fully neoclassicals claim that capital has a return on it, on it when he makes the argument for the capitalists still exploiting the labor. Right? I think there's a problem in that argument, to be honest. But let, let's get there and we'll, we'll see uh, where we go. I want to say one final thing. I just want to retract my retract my criticism of uh, Wright as following the neoclassical line on holism because Ezra informed me in between recording sessions that uh, Wright actually argued against methodological individualism, argued against the people who are saying that holism doesn't exist, and yeah. won some small ac academic victories on that point. So was that was that after he broke with Romer? Because Romer does accept methodological individualism. No, Ro Ro no, Ro Romer does. No, no, no. Um, he's always maintained, he's always defended methodological individualism, as being different from what he calls atomism, which actually does remove those properties. But he's never been, um, in that sense, a methodological individualist. He uh, he likes holistic phenomena and feedback loops and stuff. As a sociologist, like, especially a, a new left sociologist, you know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't have much to talk about if you couldn't talk about, like, relations of relations and stuff. Like... So no, he he's he positions himself as what he calls it an anti-reductionist position, where like you don't need uh, micro foundations for a valid theory. Although he does cleave a little bit close to methodological individualism when he says that, yeah, of course it's preferable if you could break down, you know, social phenomena into people. I mean, it's people, you know. Yeah, so micro foundations I, is stronger than, but not necessary. Yeah, which look, I think that's the right position. Again, like I think, it, you know, yeah, I wouldn't his, disagree like, with that. His waffling and stumbling, like, uh, you know, in different directions. I think, I think he really does zero in. Actually, this is something. This isn't even something he waffles and stumbles on for a minute, for a long time. This is one of the things that he gets right. Uh, no pun intended. Just most directly in like the the heat of the moment, and his position becomes the dominant one, not just in analytical 
Mar well, analytical Marxism kind of dies as the broader social science is basically accepting rights position. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I was actually, I'm glad you're here for this though, because even though I'm fairly versed in, in analytical Marxism, this is hiddenly about a whole lot of debates that yes. um, are frankly obscure, even when people who are vaguely familiar with analytical Marxism, or even, I like, I am more familiar than most people. Um, and, and also, deal with me. <laughs> And what we and we we've been talking about analytical Marxism since like you were twenty. So like, and now she's 20. fifty. Now she's That's fifty. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Count, um, count, count, uh, I, I, I know yeah, yeah, each other. other. I'm, I, I'm just. Yeah. Everyone knows I'm older than everyone but Tom. But Tom's the last one out. Yeah, Tom. Tom's the last man out. Um, but um, <laughs> first time to die. First time to die. <laughs> I don't no one know. said that, man. It's gonna be. It's gonna be crazy. <laughs> A few decades, anyway. Derek. Yeah. So, go but, on. so I'm glad for this, but I, this is also a criticism I have of a lot of these books because, mm -hmm. and like, it, it, similar to the, my criticism part of the Climbing book, most people who read this book do not have the context for the debates that are being waged out, and it makes it actually very easy to misinterpret what is being mm -hmm. said. Furthermore, I also think some of this is. Like some of the statements that Wright makes as normative to Marxism are actually normative to to analytic Marxism and 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 a few schools of thought adjacent to it, and even within academic Marxism, we're not as dominant a position because academic Marxism was actually dominated by post structuralists. So, I I do want to just add one thing to that is that although I totally accept your point, Ezri, I think that Wright is ex exceedingly bad at making that that point in uh, the previous chapter on Tilly in in, in, in critiquing uh, micro foundations. Yeah, unfortunately, he doesn't state his position. Uh, he defends methodological individualism from Tilly, which again, like, I didn't fucking read Tilly's book. I don't know what Tilly said. Maybe Tilly's just like, yeah, methodological individualists. They all eat babies, you know? And so like, I, I would, you know, uh, I imagine we, 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 we can't them. actually make generalizations about methodological individualists in that way. Uh, it's purely based on their individual utility calculations that uh, <laughs> they as uh, individuals decide to eat babies. No, it's that, that's, that's a pretty solid point. I prefer to think of baby eating as nobody's fault. It just kind of happens, you know, it's just like a big social abyss. <laughs> anyway, I, Where are I, we? Where are we? I, I was just going to double back and say that um, I, I kind of, I definitely wish I was here for the Tilly chapters because, I, well, the concepts are important. Who gives a shit about all these people? They're all going to be dead. And, you know, Wright is dead, unfortunately. Like uh, um, Most of these guys are dead, actually. Most, so. most, most, they're, they're all going to be dead. And these people specifically, it's not about these people. It's about the concept of the feedback loop and the yeah. concept of, you know, breaking down a feedback loop into you know, a micro foundation. So you can like try to understand it better, not to validate its existence. Right. Well, like Marx, l l Marx's capital is essentially a thing of micro foundations. Let's yes, be yes, honest. Is. Yeah. And his explicit statements on this are that all social phenomena are done by individuals and could therefore be like individually tractable on some level. Right. Like it doesn't mean that, and he doesn't always talk about, um, Glasses. he doesn't always talk about yeah individuals it, it, that's not the point but like we're not talking about fucking leptons here we're not talking about quantum gravity yeah it'd be better if we had a theory you know that connects gravity to quantum mechanics but they're you know perfectly fine on their own we're talking about people with choices like us we're talking we're the subject matter of this like every all social phenomena should be theoretically like if if you know if we're like epistemologically like lucky, if we're, if we're having a good time, right? Like we should be able to break this shit down into people who do stuff. Like that's not, that's not a crazy claim. And you could take that in the social sciences without taking it in the physical sciences, you know? Like it's because we're the subject. Anyone talking about this is the kind of thing that we're studying. That's the reflexive point that I think makes a soft individualism okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, 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 yeah, you, you uh, follow that the wholest line to its logical conclusion, and no one is responsible for anything. It's all Baby just eating. holes. Just, 
I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, the 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 holist argument does lead to the Ostracarian structuralist argument, which also, which also eventually leads to I don't know why we ever do anything because it's all a structure anyway, and we are all ideologically formed by our structures in a circular way that we can never escape. And we don't um, have an essence. There's nothing inside. It's so, eating babies all the way down. That's what yes. I'm <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's just, uh, it's, I don't know, it's a conjuncture. You know, that's why, but, yeah. why they eat babies. I mean, look, <laughs> at, I mean, look like, at that conjuncture. I think, look at the I, size I, of that conjuncture. To, to, to give us a way out and back to, to Sorensen, I actually think one of the reasons why we've been so interesting in cybernetics is cybernetics is a theory that gets you from the individual to the whole without denying either one, without making a part to hold fallacy Correct. or a whole part fallacy, which is, which in general Marxism, we have just sucked at. Like we've either done one or the other. Like well, we've, made, we've, made, we've made a methodology out of not acknowledging that those are fallacies. That's yeah. bad. That's yeah, real bad. bad. <laughs> and that's, and that's why I, when, when Wright says things about Marxists that kind of only apply to analytical Marxists, there's just a part of my brain that goes, yeah, like, and I don't know. Those other Marxists are babies, like, just to be eaten in a holistic fashion. Like, they're not <laughs> real thinkers. Well, like, but, they're, I, they're... but I also think, like, <laughs> frankly, though, this is where I'm going to push back on you. A lot of the That's analytical why. Marxists aren't <laughs> real thinkers either because, they, because their imminent critiques, frankly, cut against what they're trying to prove more often than not. And they accept whole cloth methodologies because they're academically popular. That's why uh, they do it. I, I wouldn't say that they're not real thinkers, but maybe they're not real socialists. Like maybe that like that they take on so much from the intellectual norms of the time. They are insufficiently critical of it. They develop they develop it out and it fucking yeah, it eats their lunch. Like yeah. so, somebody look, somebody had to do that before. You know, they they had to walk so we could fly, Derek. But like, I, I don't know. Like I I read the I read right in this, and I think he's a proper brain. I think he's aware of that move. I I, I find that like you can see places where the the feedback loops he's omitted. That has to be a choice. So I think that there, while he is aware of these arguments, he's also basically clipping the wings of the argument where it suits. He, I think probably his politics, to be honest, mm -hmm. or his or his career. Yeah. Take your pick. I, th I would think, I think more politics in his career, frankly. But yeah, no, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I think those yeah, two are sure. those two are intertwined. And uh, one of the big things in this book that we're going to see is that a lot of his political conclusions are based on not being able to foresee crisis as imminently as we do. Not necessarily economic crisis, although definitely. Uh, the kind of economic crisis that Marxists are generally interested in. Only so. Robert, only Robert Brenner tried to continue arguing for that kind of stuff. Right. I in, mean, Romer, yeah. and it's Romer's fault. Romer's the it's, person. It's Romer's was, fault. Like, uh, there's there's a book on crisis by Wright before he right. you know loses faith in LTV and and he's just talked out of it. It is Romer's fault. Romer Ro yeah. and Romer's modeling was all equilibrium modeling, and he was still doing it. But that, that was my point. He was still doing it when there was other, not Marxist, not weirdo sectarian, other legitimate academics who yeah. were pushing back on the framework of the equilibrium itself. Absolutely. That's not because he's stupid. That's because that's why he's at Yale now, dude. Like he, I, hence, yeah. Hence my point about career. No, I think, I think that that's part of why some of these people did it. It's not because they're not real thinkers. It's because there's something about, they saw an opportunity and they went for the stars, baby. We all say we hate these people, but if if I learned anything from like left online stuff, it's that the right's kind of got a point. The left really just like is resentful of success. They want more, more so than anything to fucking like, you know, to win the institutions and to be the best and the coolest. And like, uh, that's that's the fucking rationality some of these I, 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 do, are I do think that makes you eventually not a thinker. I think it what? makes you like because what are you thinking through? But see, Derek, what? Derek, Derek, think about getting that New York Times obituary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like I mean, there have been many times in my life where not being honest would have benefited me greatly. But 
And and the thing is, I don't want to believe that these people are are out actually deliberately dishonest, but it seems like there is it seems like there are incentives within yeah. the system that yeah. and the system here is academia that mm -hmm. prioritizes cer certain kinds of small shifts that eventually end up to a big lie. And I also think being cordoned off in these micro niches is a huge problem for this. I mean, because yeah. like, but yes. And the micro niches, which is why the analyticals were so problematically open to the norms of the time that okay. was to deliberately not intellectually cordon themselves off. And yeah. So it's, 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 it's like a sellout dynamic. Why does somebody sell out? Is it to reach an audience? Is it to get the money? Like, except this, you know, with Romer, there's a big formalization dynamic there. You know, honestly, I think Romer's work continues to be interesting at, even after he's like a Marxist. And even Derek, the kind of Marxist he is, he's, you know, arg arguing for the, his book on exploitation defends a more or less like, you know, lineal theory of, removing forms of exploitation. It's very much like Rudolf Barrow or something, but then he'll defend socially necessary exploitation in a way where, you know, not just as an anthropological point that like, you know, no, well, it's of course, it's of course capitalism, state capitalism, capitalism as a good, like yeah, it really is. Well, yeah, like, well, not just, oh, of course, capitalists defend capitalist exploitation. Of course, socialists defend socialist exploitation. Know that there's sort of historically necessary kinds of exploitation. And if you're in the society, you know, you, you defend it too, which um, Jan Elster had the decency to push back on, was revolted by. Um, yeah, so. that's interesting. That's one of the, the the more interesting things that Elster pushed back. And for people who don't know, Elster's probably the most obscure of the analytical Marxists. Because I think that people, yeah. people know E.O. Wright and G.A. Cohen more than these other figures who are actually, I mean, to be fair, outside of uh, G.A. Wright's initial book, you know, uh, a defensive Marxist theory. Oh, Karl Marx. Gia Cohen's. Yeah, Gia Cohen's yeah. offensive. I think the more serious academic work was actually done by the ones that we don't talk about that much, which is Elster and, yeah. and Romer. Elster, El 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 yeah. But also Elster is just, um, if you're into rational choice methodology, Elster is, is a super... Elster is just an influential figure. He's not just a Marxist. He, it, or, or he was not, he's not just like some Marxist like uh, crank. And he was more or less a Marxist by like national culture. Cause he's from fucking Scandawija. You know what I mean? Like he was just working that stuff out there. <laughs> Actually came to rather, you know, dour conclusions that right. He eventually has to capitulate to Wright's position. Like I think as part of Wright's influence on, on Elster, you know, Wright actually has a decent influence on how this rational choice literature gets fleshed out. Like in general. Uh, another sock dim trader. Another stand yeah. Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. So and son. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. that, it's, he's not even he's not even a, he's not even a socialist, is he? You can't how can you be a socialist uh, uh, and come up with no, a bullshit? He's no, a right winger. No, no, no cer certainly he's not. I'm I i can not imagine someone defending Sorenson, this as socialist. Yeah. yeah. Like I just thought no. I'd put that if, up there. If, 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 if he's any uh, kind of socialist, he's like a Saint Simonian. Emmanuel nailed that. He's like, oh, that that looks that looks uh, looks like he's from Denmark. That doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> we can't, we can't uh, trust the dates. <laughs> dear God. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh. Let's get, I'm going to go on to the slide. Right. Let me right. let me read this. Yeah, one. We've had a a bit of a detour there. I think we have uh, all detours all the time. <laughs> all detours all the time. All detours all the way down. Okay. So Sorensen Sorensen's model of rent based exploitation. 